Welcome to MICE 2019, day two. Um, and welcome to the comics and art education panel. Um, this is MICE's 10th uh, year, as you probably know, and I want to give a special thank you to our host, Leslie Art and Design. And <laughs> And today, and for this panel, a triple thank you to Leslie Art and Design because they not only provide the, the building and the space and so many other things, um, they are actually specifically sponsoring this panel. Um, and we have a panelist from Leslie Art and Design, Kate <laughs> Castelli, with us. Um, and I also want to uh, tell you, if you don't know, MICE is produced by the Boston Comic Arts Foundation, BCAF, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we started it a few years ago uh, so that MICE could be a nonprofit, but gave it a, a grander name and, uh, and, and mission so that we may uh, uh, use the foundation to further the art of independent comics in the Boston area and, and beyond. Um, so far we have helped uh, support and assist with a few newer festivals such as the Boston Kids Comic Fest which is will have its third annual show uh, this spring, the Comics in Color Festival which will have its first show this spring, and Podtails which is actually a uh, dramatic podcast festival which is happening right now for the first time next door and uh, looks really good from when I stuck my head in. So check that out if you're interested in podcasts. Um, I think that's it. So I will give you over to Michael John Francesco, the moderator of this panel. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to be the moderator of this panel. Um, so we're just going to move right forward. I mean, the only other thing I'll say about MICE is this is, I go to shows all over the country every year. This is my favorite show. Um, I've been in New York, Chicago, San Diego, Seattle, and this is the chillest, awesomest, greatest place to meet real artists and buy books. Um, I've been coming every year for 10 years, and I've been involved a number of times over those years. So I'm thrilled to be here and with these amazing educators here. So we'll just move right on here to our topic. But first, we'll introduce um, our panelists, um, starting with, well, me. I'm not really a panelist, but I'm a moderator. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Gianfrancisco. I've been teaching high school English for 15 years in the Providence area. I also am an adjunct uh, professor of English at Johnson & Wales University and the founder of an educational cohort of teachers who love using comics called LitX. If you want to know more information about that, come and see me after the panel. Uh, I'm going to move on to Kathy G. Johnson. I'm going to allow her to talk about herself and how amazing she is. <laughs> um. Am I just reading this? No, you can say whatever All you right, want. Okay, I'm a cartoonist, printmaker, and educator. Um, I'm ba I live in Providence, Rhode Island. I teach uh, throughout New England. Um, I like to drive a lot. So I teach in Massachusetts, and I do a lot of stuff in New York City as well, and in addition to Rhode Island. Um, I have a... <laughs> <laughs> MA in it's actually teaching and learning in art and design. <laughs> um, T lad, um, an art and design education um, master's degree um, from Rhode Island School of Design in Providence. Um, I also co host a comics uh, scholarship podcast called Drawing a Dialogue, um, in which uh, I talk about art education and um, comic books and then <laughs> and then um i also have a website called comic art ed where i share um lesson plans and student work and all that stuff if you are looking for resources on teaching comics in your classroom k through 12 education pre-k um and then i also uh, have a new book out for middle grade audiences called the breakaways thank you I would like to plug uh, the podcast graphic novel TK. If you are an artist, you should be listening to it. And Kathy was on it. Uh, uh 
talk, representing educators. It's an amazing episode, whether you're an educator or an artist or an artist who is interested in education. So I would encourage you to check that out. Thank you. And next is Joel Christian Gill. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> That was weird. Um, so yeah, I'm Joel Christian Gill. Um, I'm a cartoonist and professor of illustration at Mass College of Art and Design. Previously, I was chair of comic arts at the um, New Hampshire Institute of Art, which no longer exists. May it rest in peace. Um, and what else is up there? Um, I've published five graphic novels. Um, my first one was, my first series is Strange Fruit, Uncelebrated Narratives from Black History. Um, I do another series about black history called Tales of the Talented Tenth. Um, last year, I published my first picture book, which was a book called Fast Enough, Bessie Stringfield's First Ride. And in January of 2020, my, my book that's not about black history, it's just personal history, is a memoir called Fights. Um, and the, best, the, the way I've described Fights to a lot of people, which is not funny, but it actually is a funny way to describe it, it's like Raina Telgemeier's smile, only with the N-word and violence. Um, so that's the, the, it's about what happens to kids that are um, surviving trauma and violence. And every chapter, that the book, every chapter in the book is about a fight. I got into a kid and what was around it. Um, but I've been teaching um, comics in some way, shape, or form for the last almost 15 years. And Joel will not sell me his copy of Fights today, which is making no. me want to fight him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next is uh, a person who I had the pleasure of collaborating at the Rhode Island Writing Project this past spring with uh, on a workshop, uh, Cara Bean. Hello. Um, okay, so for since 2005, I was a, a teacher at Lexington High School, that, um, an art teacher doing comics and drawing and all kinds of art. Um, and then in the last couple of years, I actually have left that position to work full time on a, a comic for um, young adults about mental health and uh, using comics to explain depression and anxiety and addiction and um, seeking help. And it's an ongoing process. I'm still in the middle of that. Um, and then I also do workshops, uh, like we, I did with Michael, with teachers. So I'll go in and teach teachers how to use comics in their classroom and get them drawing and get them comfortable using cartooning as a language um, to teach with. And I love also things like mice. I'll do workshops here in libraries where I'll just work with the general public and do things too. So I, I, love, in, I love to draw and make comics by myself, but I also love interacting with people and getting them creative and working with me. And last but certainly not least, representing Lesley University here at this panel, uh, Katrina Castelli. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's on. It just doesn't sound like All right. Cool. I'm us I usually project my voice in the classroom, so it's all good. Um, I'm Kate Castelli. I'm the chair of illustration and visual narratives here at uh, Lesley Art and Design. Uh, I've been teaching in illustration for the last 10 years. And unlike my fellow panelists, I'm actually not a comic artist. I come from an artist book and text and image background. Um, however, I was instrumental in developing the visual narrative program here at Lesley Art and Design with an intense focus on how do we kind of bridge that gap between text and image and elevate it into an art form that's really, really kind of respected around the world. Um, so it's a very interesting process. It's our first year uh, in that program. And if you're interested in more, check out our table. And we have an open house coming up. So <laughs> shameless plug, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I would very much like to be your friend. <laughs> um, so let's get right into to some of the questions. These questions were generated by the, uh, the panelists mostly. Um, so we'll start with, um, very simply, how can comics be an asset for art educators? <laughs> Don't worry about what's up there. I'll read it for you. <laughs> Well, comics are amazing for art educators. Um, there are so many reasons why. Um, there, there's, they are just a vessel that you can pour anything into, and it can be um, simple and easy, and it can also be incredibly complex. Uh, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, one of the what I've always told people is comics is the sneakiest way to teach people stuff um, because. As a, as a society and a culture, we're visual. You know, we, we connect 
through um, semiotics and we connect through a lot of different things about this, this shared cultural understanding of images. And so when you are reading comics, you are tapping into that shared cultural understanding of, of images. And so when, when you use comics to do that, it's, it's like I said, it's a sneaky way of teach people. You don't, if, when comics works well, you don't realize you're reading, you don't realize you're working, looking at pictures, you actually are absorbing this thing sort of organically. And so when you can give kids those things and don't ever, like one of the, the most irritating things ever is when kids say, when people say comics is not real reading. Um, somebody actually told my son that and he goes, really, do you know what my dad does? <laughs> um, um, and so like that idea that you know, like you're, you're just, you're, you're bringing all of these things together. So it's, it's tapping into a visual understanding of writing, uh, a visual understanding of information and, a uh, um, and, a written understanding of inf information. So you're actually tapping in two of the major ways in which we actually learn, which is visual and written. And so I think that's the way to think about it. Like comics is, is a sneak, like if you hear nothing else that I said, comics is a sneaky way of teaching stuff, people stuff. <laughs> and this is a story that I, um, keep going back to again and again when I'm at answering this kind of question where um, I had an eighth grade, I had a group of eighth graders who were um, doing this, not necessarily summer school, but it was basically summer school. Um, and we were in their English class and um, I'm an art teacher. So I was their art teacher, but I was helping out the English teacher. And I had a student who just refused to write this poem. He was supposed to write this poem. He wouldn't write down a single word. It was like a huge struggle for him. And then we, then English class ended and we walked downstairs to my art classroom and then we started making a comic book and he started drawing and he was like, oh, I want to, like, I really want to write the story. It's about this alien and I want to tell the story about when he goes into space. And I was like, oh, well then, um, and he was like, how do you spell this word? How do you write this word? I want to write this story. And it just was like the way in which drawing drew out this like, need to learn to for literacy in him was just like it was just night and day in like i don't know a half hour span drawing drew out i see what you did there <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> but it is it is that i mean there's like I, there's probably thousands of stories like that where it is the magic of comics um, inspires learning it's true that reminds i did a workshop and i gave them a comic assignment and actually one little boy had a really hard time um, wanting to draw and then um, he actually started crying and I was like oh no like don't be upset it's okay um, and then he's like well I have this story but I don't he got very frustrated drawing and then I said well why don't I draw it for you and like you tell me the story and then we teamed up and made the comic together but it, it's sort of yeah it's a way to keep the conversation going one way or the other like it yeah it's a it's a bridge maker and um, it's and it, it'll get students on board that might otherwise not be uh, confident even speaking for myself I I didn't think of myself as a writer growing up I just I was someone that always doodled and drew and um, it wasn't until I started making comics that other people started referring to me as a writer, and I'm like, what? I'm a writer? What? Me? <laughs> um, and, you know, comics helped me get there, so of course it would be there for kids. Do you have anything to add, Kate? You look I mean, like you other than, say you know, to echo a little bit of, of what Joel was saying is I think there's a really kind of brilliant history in humanity of from cave paintings to web comics. Like, we're conditioned to learn through images. Um, and I think it's, it's always kind of funny to me to have that separated out as some special thing that we're doing, you know, especially in the modern era. And it's like, no, we've been doing this for centuries. Um, and I think there's just such a rich history across many cultures. Um, you know, and figure children start with, with children's illustrated books. How do we transition into a much more sophisticated kind of language and agency? I think I really love the agency of comics mm -hmm. and the ability, you know, for storytelling in that way. Um, so I think it's just a really wonderful thing that we should be encouraging, not as a modern mode of communication, but as just a continuing history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an art teacher. I'm an English teacher. Um, I just wanted to point out, while we have art educators, I think... Uh, comics are an asset in all classrooms, um, history, English, even mathematics, business. Um, there's, there's comics uh, that represent all of those areas. Um, so those of you that are educators, um, you should have comics in your classroom library. Um, so considering the potential of the interconnectedness between art and text, what's the best way to combine these in an art course? How do you do it in your classes? So... Um 
J.W. Mitchell wrote this book called, I think it's J.W. Mitchell wrote this book called Word and Image. And in this book, he talks about all media is multimedia. As soon as you combine words and images, it's all media is multimedia. And so I think when you're, when you're thinking about, um, when you think about comics programs in general, this was one of the things that when we built the comics program at, um, in New Hampshire, it was about this idea of like comics is not about just drawing pictures and it's not just about writing words. It's like what I said before, like the best comics are when you completely forget that you're doing one or the other. And so it's an amalgam of those two things. It's a complete immersion of both the words and the pictures so that they don't, you know, one doesn't do one doesn't do the thing that both that one one doesn't overpower the other um and if one does overpower the other it's specifically to a purpose right it's like this idea that you have to use the words and the images together but if you want to take the image out um think about the last like 10 pages of watchmen and i'm going to spoil watchmen but if you haven't read it then i hate you um but the last 10 pages of watchmen when it's just full page spreads of, you know, the, the, dec the decimation of New York, right? And that's specifically used because it's like a six panel grid. I mean, it's a nine panel grid for the entire comic. And then this last one is like double page spreads with no words in it. So that's what, that's why how you use the art. That's when you spend the time on the art. But then there are places where it's just, it's just prose. It's just the written word that actually informs other thing. But when you're looking at the comic in and of itself, it's this combination of this way that what you you design the page, the way you look at the page. Um, my favorite part of that is like if you look at, I, I have an entire lecture about um, um, Dr. Manha um, Dr. Manhattan going to Mars and that he's looking for his humanity, but when he actually finds his humanity, it's actually in the center of the page. So it's arranged around that grid. So it's like using the words and pictures and the way in which we compose those things all together to, to make images. And so the, the most, like the best way to teach a comics class, if you're teaching comics, is like it's about the words and the image. You can't separate one out. You can't say that we're going to write for comics, we're going to draw for comics, because if you don't know either one of those things, it's just not going to work. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I, I often tell my students that the, the one thing you are in control of is what's on the page. You know, so thinking about all of these things as separate components doesn't actually do your narrative or your your kind of storytelling justice. You want to think about how these things speak to each other, um, how they reinforce each other. And as a person who actually I frequently love non um, text-based comics, actually like wordless books, thinking about how words actually serve the images. Um, we really just don't have rules about how that works and thinking about if it works, it works, right? You know, how are you thinking about that page? How are you thinking about turning that page? Um, and as long as you can kind of engage that, I think it's really important to not think about things separately in the sense that you have to be a writer, you have to be a drawer, or you have to be an artist. Pull it all together into this package and this platform that's deliverable to an audience. And there's a lot of agency in that, I think. Yeah, so when I'm teaching as children um, comics making classes, I, n I'm never like, okay, now we're writing. Now we're going to do a drawing. It's always like drawing is the ideation process that is the process that creates the story. And then the story just comes at the same time. I always try to, all my lessons are more based on coming up with really fun ideas and how to come up with ideas. And then, then that motivates what they want to learn for like spelling or what they want to learn for storytelling and stuff but it's more like I feel like the benefit of comics is just like coming up with a bunch of fun ideas and telling your story and exercising that creativity and that um, imagination. One thing I guess I could add is um, the fun thing about being an art teacher is you're sort of uh, you can kind of do whatever you want no one's really noticing what's going on in there. Um, no, there's no like MCAS and stuff in there happening. Um, so like I could do all kinds of little experiments and some things that I could do within comics and I was just sort of tested out to see who, which students kind of clicked with what kind of thinking. So like one exercise would be like, okay, like here's, here's a comic with already has pictures in it and you add the word bubbles and some kids jam like, oh great, like I'm pretty clever at coming up with like, you know, an interaction here. Um, and then others where... Um, there were word bubbles already there, and then you can draw in something, and you can try it that way. Um, and 
Uh, oh, and then like let's say there's um, you know a poem or something, and you can break it up into panels however you want to do it and see what happens. And they could these could just be like 15 minute little exercises that you do, you know, just to start the day or that sort of thing. But it's a it's a um, very open and playful place to for different kinds of minds. And. Jumping off of what uh, Joel's point was, where there was actually a research study in Japan where they uh, had uh, kids come and read manga, and then there were some kids who were manga readers and they read it all the time, and there were some kids who weren't as familiar with the language of comic books. And so the children who were less familiar, they tracked the eye movement. So they tracked how much they were reading. So these students who were unfamiliar with comics read every word, and they looked at the picture, like they followed the eye movement, right? And they went slower with their reading. Um, and then the students who were used to reading manga, like the eye movement was like, <laughs> like it was so much faster. And then there was like a, then there was a questionnaire about what happened in the story. But the students who were familiar with the language of comics and just sort of whipped on through knew so much more about what happened in the story than the students who read every single word. Because <laughs> there's something more happening than just the words and just the images. It's that combination that there's a lot more happening than just the combination is greater than the part, some of its parts, right? Or something, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think that you know, one of the things that I struggle with sometimes when, when people, people want to talk about my work or they, want me, wanna, they invite me to come and talk someplace, is like, we want to have a show of your art. And I'm like, my art is the book. Mm-hmm. My art is not the individual totally. page. It's kind of like it's kind of like asking a painter to show you what kind of paint what kind of paint he used. We're gonna put that paint you use in display. <laughs> I mean, so like I actually had the uh, um, one of my colleagues, the chair of photography at my old school, um, was like making fun of me. He's like, we're gonna have this show, this this faculty show, and like you're gonna put together your work. And I'm like, I ain't, I don't really have time for that. He's like, just send me some stuff and I'll print it off. So he sent me some stuff and printed off and went and bought some cheap frames and put some stuff in the frames. And he's like, you should take care of your stuff. You should like you know, like you should be, you know, he was like, he was like lecturing me and I was just like, but that's not really my work, right? It's almost taking my work out of context when you just like look at one image, like, because it's almost the entire thing. And I think that's the thing that we have to think about when you look at comics is that it's an entire thing. It's like, it's like, it's the way the words work with the images. And so like having a, a, a program or a class where you're just teaching one or the other is not going to work. You're not going to get an understanding of it. And I think that's the thing. When I, when we ran the, when I was running the program at NHIA in New Hampshire, I was saying, I would call the students, I'm like, I think there's two ways to think about this. There are people who are cartoonists and there are people who are comic book artists. And cartoonists are people, and comic book artists are people who want to collaborate with a writer and make something. Your, Your main purpose or your main mode of expression is to draw comics in collaboration with somebody else, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're a cartoonist, you almost like, that's like a true auteur. Like that's somebody who does not want to collaborate, who wants to control the story. They also want to write the words and draw the pictures and figure out, you know, what kind of pants Thomas Jefferson is wearing in that story that you just wrote about Thomas Jefferson, right? So like, (laughs) it's that kind of thing. So, you know, like, and, and it's not that one is better than the other. They're just different. They're just different ways of thinking about things so with uh, a comic book artist you like you're collaborating you're more along the lines of an illustrator but if you are like someone who like when you think of when you think of trying to tell stories you think of like if you think of like when you want to make something it's a story it's the entire story I want to do this story and this is the thing and I'm going to draw a comic that's a completely different mode of thinking and so it requires two separate things it's like it's not about it's not about narrative it's about story which is completely different than narrative so Sorry, it's a lot of words. It's, good. It's, good. <laughs> it's a lot of words. No one ever accused me of not being able to talk. <laughs> well, we're teachers. Teachers love to talk. Um, so last year I taught a course uh, called the Modern Graphic Novel, and one of the activities I did with my students is I, I, I asked the kids in the room who considers themselves an artist, right? That's the question. At some point, sometime after elementary school, you start saying things like, I'm no artist, and you stop drawing, whereas you draw pretty much up to that point. So I... I separated the kids by that uh, criteria, kids that, that identified themselves as decent artists or artists and kids that didn't. And I paired them up. And then I said, you're going to create a comic, a mini comic, and the person who is good at drawing is going to write it. And the person that said they're not is going to draw it. And they were really angry <laughs> uh, and confused. Um, and I did let them switch back later. 
Um, but I wanted to get the, the idea of, you know, as you said, drawing pictures, writing words, or uh, drawing words and writing pictures, um, which is the name of a really great book uh, that you should get. Um, so the next question is, uh, I've been teaching 15 years and I've been fighting the tide of comics are not real reading, as Joel brought up earlier. We hear that all the time, uh, even still today. Um, and they don't belong in schools and that old adage of the kid hiding the comic behind the textbook um, so that the teacher doesn't see it. So how even now do we broaden that acceptance in the academic world for comics, uh, particularly when there are still uh, systems in place that are protecting the canon of standard chapters? Chapter texts uh, in in time in or you know whatever stands for that tradition in the art classroom, like the classic uh, art, sculpture, painting. How do we bring comics into that world? I mean, I'll jump in at the the higher ed end of um, you know this is even a question that our students face and I face um, in terms of where where do comics and visual narratives fit in this canon of art history, right? There's a there's a fight for legitimacy in terms of what is the value of that storytelling, and I always always go back to the kind of the human history of it is that this is a way that we have been interacting with the world and and our experiences for a very, very long time. And I think the more platforms we see visual narratives and comics out there, you know, so I think Joel actually even in your last couple of statements talking about the objecthood, this is this book is the piece. And I think that's a really challenging thing in higher ed in the kind of museum world and academic world of like, what do you mean the book is the piece? Um, and I think there's there's something in that that we need to start kind of breaking down, that this is a valid form of expression. It's a valid form of interacting with the world. And if anything, I think it gives agency to a lot of different voices in particular that might not be able to break into that kind of traditional publishing world, that traditional art world. Um, where you see people doing independent comics and different kind of platforms that aren't even printed. It, there's an accessibility and an agency in how you can get that out there. And I think we need more of that. And it's not going to, the problem isn't going to be solved overnight, but I think the more that we can recognize it as a legitimate form of expression and a legitimate, legitimate form of experience, it's going to be easier to accept it in a classroom space and a museum space and an academic space. There's a lot of, um, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's just old fashioned thinking mm -hmm. about what cartoonists and comic book artists do. Um, I was working on my second book at my previous institution and um, I draw on a digital tablet, whether it's a mobile studio pro, now it's an iPad or whatever. So I was sitting in like in a, I was just sitting randomly somewhere waiting for a meeting and I was drawing and um, the chair of painting came by <clears throat> and he was like, is that what you do your little cartoons on? He does this thing right here. <laughs> is that what you do with your little cartoons on? And I literally turned to him. I'm like, the New York Times has written about my little cartoons. Have they ever written about your paintings? Um, <laughs> because there's this idea that like, first of all, there's this idea that it's diff like it's easy. Like this is like that simple, that simplicity that you're drawing is really easy. Um, and if, and I always say, if you think it's easy, try it. Um, and then they also think that it's a dumbed down because it's so connected to pop culture. Right. And this is a, like everything that makes money, um, in art has this way of been, has this way of, um, being evaluated in terms of a Marxist, Marxist ideology that anything connected to the market is a bad thing. And so like that, that's a problem with illustration because it, until about the 1850s or 1860s, we actually have this clear understanding that they're artists, right? They're not artists and then they're illustrators, they're artists. But as soon as Marx has come, as soon as Marx writes his book and then he starts talking about the, the you know, com capitalism being bad, anything that's connected to capitalism gets a bad rap. And so when illustrators are starting to make money, people are like, oh, that's not a high art because you're you're selling out your thing. You're selling out yourself, right? Um, so there's a little bit of that, and then it gets even more when it, get, it gets complicated when people start looking at comics as a as a genre, and not a medium. Yep. Um, because comics is not like I actually had this guy come and work at my house, and he was, he was some a contractor, and he's like, so what? Like I'm at home and I'm drawing, right? And he's like, so what are you doing? I'm like, I'm I'm a professor and I'm a cartoonist, and he's like, oh, you draw comics, and I'm like, yeah. He goes for Marvel or DC, and I said neither. 
right? Because it's like I don't draw comics about. I love superheroes, and that's you know like that's what I. But I'm not like that's not what I draw, right? And so I think there's this understanding, and there are people that always want to introduce me as a graphic novelist as opposed to a cartoonist. They're like, I want to elevate you to this higher standard. Like graphic novels are a different thing than comics, and I'm like, um, no, comics and graphic novels are the same thing. And it was just because. Will Eisner and a bunch of other people decided that comics, we needed to make this new thing because we want to get out of comics and be sort of recognized as this, that as something better that we say graphic novel anyway. But that becomes this idea that um, there's something, there's something less than with comics and that there's something more than with graphic novels when it's not, you know, it's, it's, this is like the, you know, this is the medium is comics. This is how we express ourselves and it's really complicated. And if you think it's not complicated, read Persepolis. If you think it's not complicated, read Mouse. If you think it's not complicated, read, you know, read how T Raina Telgemeier is like the number one selling writer, artist anything in America right now with a book about her digestive system that's like <laughs> geared toward little girls. You know what I mean? So like if you think it's like if you think that's easy, go and do it, right? Like it's not that. It's like it's it's like I said, it's mixed it's understanding that this is truly mixed media and that you're truly dealing with stories and words and pictures creating stories. And and the more I, I guess the more old fashioned thinking retires in academia, um, the more likely we are to accept this. And I think that's why English departments are one of the places that they really accept this because they understand that this is a complicated, you know, like understand, like understanding metaphor, metonym, and all this other really complicated things when it comes to writing is really hard, right? Now, like add the complication of drawing that on top of it, right? So when you write, it's like show, don't tell. But then add drawing on top of it. So it's show and tell. But what do you show and then what do you tell? Like those things get really super complicated. And people think it's just, oh, you're just drawing little silly pictures. I'm like, yeah, go try it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, um, a master's uh, painting student, an MFA painting student who, because I, I was working on this graphic novel while I was getting my uh, master's degree in education. And um, she was like, wait, you're drawing 200 pages. And I was like, yes, it's 200 pages with like, you know, average of like four panels, five panels per page. And she goes, I spend months on one picture. <laughs> She's like, I can't imagine. I can't come up with that many pictures. <laughs> I was like, I've never imagined in my life that a painter would, <laughs> would be impressed by me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's so interesting because I think, you know, tapping in this like high and low culture and, and this connection to pop culture and consumerism and it's, it's somehow sullied. But then I always think, I always laugh because they said books were dead, mm -hmm. right? And we're, you know, oh, everybody's printed, yeah. on their Kindle or their tablet. And we're Paintings are dead every 10 years. Yeah, and then it's suddenly just being like, I'm sorry, but like most of the New York Times bestseller list is graphic novels and they're published in book form. They can be consumed elsewhere, but it's, I just think it's, it's so easy to put things into black and white categories, and I think the world is moving towards a gray area in which we can't categorize everything. Um, you know, so if the New York Times bestseller is a graphic novel, well, maybe we should re-examine what you know what we're considering um, that should be kind of taught in, in this canon of stuff. Um, I love this idea of objecthood and screenhood and things existing in all sorts of different realms, um, because again, it's just a point of access, right? You know, it's like not everybody's going to walk into a bookstore or be able to go into a library and get the book. Maybe we do need to have more stuff in different platforms. Um, and I just think it's it's ridiculous to me that there's this kind of bias, and we've all felt it. Um, and it is, it's, it's, art is work. It's hard work. Um, and being a writer is work and it's hard work. So combining the two is kind of a superpower. In a lot and, of ways. and if you're looking at like the K to 12 education realm, it's almost, it's kind of valuable that this like, uh, like low art, high art thing is happening because then it feels very accessible to our students. Like they're like, comics are kind of for us. Like the like Renaissance paintings are like a lot harder to understand. It doesn't feel like you can do that. But you look at a comic and you kind of feel like you can do it. <laughs> I feel like it's kind of valuable. <laughs> there is that. There is that. It, I mean, it's like, neither, you know, I think it's both ways. I really do. Yeah. It also reflects a modern population. You know, it's like we've always had this, you know, it, art history is like a bunch of dead white dudes for the most part, right? You know, and especially how we teach it in a traditional setting in this kind of Western canon. If you so, teach it poorly. 
Yeah, and right. the, the, this but the you, you idea know, of canonization too. Right. Yeah, but, but you know what I mean. It's it's yeah. only really recently that we have started to look at and kind of question that narrative. So when you have all of these genres and all of these kind of um, graphic memoirs and comics and all of these kind of narratives coming from different perspectives, you're more likely to see yourself reflected in that than when you walk into a museum or a gallery or an art history book. Um, so I think it's just you know it's. It's kind of a wonderful modern medium in that sense that we can only go up from here and you know screw the capitalists. Yeah, I was I was talking to I I was talking to a group of students in Dedham and um who from um the Boston schools, and they were saying I was like okay so who's been to the Boston MFA, and they were like a lot of them were like kind of dismissive and like they were like we hate art and which is okay I like expect that from middle schoolers. Um, and then I was like, well, like, uh, they were like, we don't see anyone who looks like us in the Boston MFA. And I was like, yeah, that's probably really legit and really true. I, I'm like, I don't, I don't fault you for thinking you hate art. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, I don't. When the art yeah. that you've encountered up until then is, you know, in this like pedestal world of, you know, we have to analyze it and it means every single thing means something. It's like, it's hard. And I think there's an essay by Willem Warringer, who was a critic um, that was written in the 19. 19- 40s, 50s, called Empathy and Art. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this essay, he specifically said that in order to actually, like, in order to make a great work of art, this is, I'm paraphrasing this and I'm butchering it a little bit, but um, to, to make a great work of art, you actually have to see yourself in it in some way, shape, or form. And it's really interesting because he's talking, you know, he's talking in the middle of like abstract expressionism and how people are seeing themselves in that, in that, then that nothing there, but this is exactly what Scott McCloud was talking about in the simplistic forms of cartoons, right? In comics, is that the, the the simpler you make them, and the less likely they are to be a specific type of person, the more likely you are to relate to those things. And I think that that's that's one of those things that comics does. And I think that's that's there and therein lies the problem with like the high art, low art thing. Like yeah. people are looking at these things and they're going, because they are simplistic, they are not rising to the level of high art. But I'm saying that because they are simplistic, they are appealing to more people. And that's going to inevitably bring more success. So I don't think those two things can, you know, the success and the consumerism and the capitalism can be devoid from the actually idea that, you know, like hundreds of thousands and millions of little girls are looking at Raina Telgemeier's books and they're seeing themselves in it. Mm-hmm. I have a challenge for you, Joel. I <laughs> this is like no, you're all making amazing points, and I just have this funny um, memory that like has like resurfaced as we're all talking. But um, years ago, Kathy put on this amazing show in um, Providence called Ripe, and much like like a little mice, and and I uh, tabled at it. And as I was at the table, um, this gentleman came up to my comics and he picked them up and kind of was like, mm-hmm, eh. you know, like not nice. <laughs> and um, I'm just watching when he, and I don't know that he was a professor at RISD, but like he kind of looked like maybe he was Sorry a professor. And, um, and he said this thing and I didn't have a comeback. So this is my challenge. You're, you're going to pretend to be me and I'll be this guy. <laughs> okay. Cause you were really good at this. And I was like, uh, and so he looks at the pain and goes, Oh, what is this? Like looking around at the whole room. And he's like, so I guess this is where, um, people ca- who can't hack it in the art world world end up. And I was like, and I didn't say anything. That's a really interesting thing um, for... There's no lightning come back there. Fight, fight, fight. Yeah, it's like the idea that because this is the way you choose to make something, like there's a history of this, right? This is a history of painters saying printmakers aren't good or (laughs) photographers saying that, like, and they're all feeding off of one one another and saying that this is the thing and that is the thing. And to like look at comics and cartoonings and say, this is where you can't make it in the art, art world. You can actually make the same argument about being a professor. Right? <laughs> Do you know what I'm in saying? Rhode like, Island. <laughs> like, you, why aren't you in New York? Why aren't you at the? Why aren't you at Yale? Like, it's just up the road. That's where the best art school. Now you, you know, know I mean? like eighty percent of artists who are like and like fine artists who are showing in New York have an MFA from Yale. You know yeah. that's all that's happening. <laughs> I'm t- and I'm just saying, like, you know, like you're teaching. You're not like, you know, like you're not in art in America. You're not, you know, like nobody's. Who? Where are they writing about your stuff in the art and you know, like. That's, that's, that thing is so ridiculous to me. Like, like defining success is is a, is elitist in that way. And so, like, 
those people you just can't really like you can't reach them right yeah, like that's just again. like, like why that's why like, like you pointing out like yeah why are you yeah, here why are you here <laughs> pointing out that <laughs> pointing out that like i'm not doing something but i'm actually more devoted so this is um there's a guy <laughs> so like I, yeah yeah so um Alec Longstreth, who is a cartoonist, and he's a teacher at the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. He does a bunch of Kickstarters. He does this book called, he did this book called Basewood, and he does the book called Isle of Elsie that he's just kickstarted. He's just actually finishing now. And he's an amazing teacher and a really just great human being. And um, for a long time, I used to have him come and talk at my classes at NHIA until he moved out. Um, out west. And one of the things that he said is that if you are the kind of person who is working as a barista, right, like you're spending eight hours a day, like making coffee and you're coming home and spending five hours a day um, making your work and spending your time as, on your art as a cartoonist, you're actually more devoted than people who are like only spending eight hours because you're actually spending 13, 12, 13, 14 hours ma like making sure that you make your work, right? It's like, it's, you know, it's David Smith's question to a young artist like it's the first thing you wake up in the morning thinking about and the last thing you think about at night so this dude that comes by randomly looks at your stuff and dismisses it and walks off like it's one of those things it's like why, where are you on a Saturday afternoon why aren't you somewhere making stuff you know what I'm saying like I, here I am like super devoted to my craft and you're like coming by and dismissing it because you don't understand it or you don't do it I mean that's like the that's the that's the genesis of like elitism. I don't understand it. I don't do it. So I don't care. It's the same thing that the Nazis said about um, Guernica, right? They walk by Guernica, one of the greatest paintings in the 20th century that's like powerful and amazing. And they're like, looks like a child can do it, right? And where are the Nazis now? And we're still talking about Guernica. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just saying like well, that, yeah. is, that thing happens all the Hitler time. Hitler did flunk out of art school. I, I know. <laughs> I mean, we should do a comic about the world would be a better place if Hitler had gone to art school. <laughs> <laughs> he would have probably learned some humanity. I know. Yeah. Sorry, um, I like get on a soapbox. I no, I it. love it. I feel better. I know we've been on this question for a long time. I'm very sorry, but question? I have one more thing. I'm sorry to I doubt must. my ability as a moderator. Um, <laughs> so, not to plug drawing a dialogue, my podcast, but um, so that's part of the project for drawing a dialogue, right? Is the this this trying to connect? We talk about. Um, school to prison price pipeline incarceration. We talk about uh, transphobia. We talk about all sorts of different topics, and and in, in a scholarship and research based capacity, and then connecting it to education and connecting it to comics. That is sort of the project, and then also drawing a dialogue is also just a podcast, so you can turn it on and listen to it. So it's much more accessible than. Uh, publishing in journals or um, and so that's actually part of the project is like making these connections and making them accessible to try to help heighten um, the standing of comics I suppose uh, not to belabor this point any further <laughs> uh, but when belabor you talk, it yeah I'm going Amen. for it um, Joel and Kara both talked about experiences where people kind of put down the craft or comics. Recently, I was getting in a fight on Facebook about politics, you know, like you do. Uh, really? These days. Uh, yeah, Joel is a friend on Facebook. He's probably seen where I've gone. Uh, not to bring politics into this conversation, but let's just say it's a generic political argument. Um, and a friend of mine who I use friends with several air quotes around um, ended our discussion by telling me, calling me Spider Man and telling me to go read a comic. <laughs> knowing that that I you know my life's work is bringing comics to classroom and bringing comics to teachers in the classroom so he later apologized for that um, uh, but you know to the idea that that's where he went with his insult thinking that being called spider-man would be an insult like <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life for people to think I'm spider-man so yeah. uh, and telling me to go read a comic I probably I was like I have <laughs> four long boxes that I have to get through for my, to curate for my classroom library, so I'm always reading a comic. Um, but to think that for that, that perspective was an insult, I found, you know, amusing at the least, and, and 
uh, fascinating from an intellectual level at the, at the best. Um, I want to combine the next two questions. I really do want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So I'm going to, we've already kind of covered the third point here about the idea of I have no artist mentality to some degree, I think. Um, so I want to combine the next two questions. I know, Kara, this was from you, and I want to make sure you have a chance to speak on this, because this was the topic of our uh, workshop yeah. uh, at the Writing Project. The idea of comics and comic art used as tools for social and emotional learning, uh, as well as championing, and I know that, Kathy, you brought this up to some degree earlier, championing equity and inclusion work, diversity, equal educational opportunities. We just kind of like mush these two questions into one, and I'll present that to the panel now. <laughs> so there you go. Go for it. Okay. Um, well, the social, social and emotional um, has really become a passion of mine, but it, um, so it was exciting that I, Michael and I connected on that. But the reason it happened, the origin story for me, was I um, had been teaching in a high school, and we do this thing every once in a while where teachers teach teachers, and it's like a half day, and we present something, and then you can teach what you do to the rest of the faculty. And I was like, oh, I'll do comics, like this will be fun. Um, and I'm pretty like fun and silly in the classroom, and um, I just thought it would be a good time. And actually, teaching adults, it wasn't a good time. Some people were super upset and like did not want to draw, and like it was someone cried, like it was bad. No, like it wasn't good. And I was like, oh my god, what just happened? Like that was really bad. And um, I was obsessed over it. Like, okay, like I want to do over, do over. And the great thing about teaching. Um, is that it is a do-over. It's, uh, you know, Groundhog Day, like, all the time. You just, the same things can totally happen the next year. So I had a year to think about it, and I actually put together a um, slideshow for adults in drawing, um, and that made me realize, oh, like, there might be, like, teachers that aren't allowing comics in their classroom because they have hang-ups about art themselves, and they have trauma about whether they can be creative and they can be hung up on, like, their own issues with art, and that stops the kids like a connection that could potentially happen. Um, so um, the, the workshop that we did, we, you know, we talked about comics that are great to read, and I, I actually did a, a similar um, workshop over the summer, and it was a two-day, and the first day we talked about, you know, great comics that, are, um, that open up the topics of social and emotional learning, and then the second day we drew together. And the first day, everybody was super calm and cool, and it was really you know, uh, thoughtful and sharing ideas. And the second day, everybody freaks out. But I was ready for it that time. Um, and because uh, I was like, this is going to happen. And um, so, uh, you know, part of my uh, work sometimes that I do with colleagues and friends that are teachers or just adults is like helping them like loosen up a little bit and, and um, heal whatever wounds they have about making art and so that we can make art together. But the reason why comics are so great, I, I have a few things I just wanted to cover, um, is the flexibility of time in comics and that you can jump forward and backwards, you can go back to your childhood, you can imagine your future, you can explore um, many moments within right, the right now, the today. Um, the concept of self is really important, so you can be anything and you are anything that you draw, or you can also separate yourself. I'm not my anxiety, I'm not my depression. Um, that is a separate monster or creature that is not me. I'm not my addiction. Um, so it, it, that concept of self is very powerful and it's accessible in comics and that's get huge. Um, it's a mindful, drawing itself is a mindful activity and can kind of ease and calm a person. Um, so it's a great thing to just bring in as a, just an exercise. Um, and then uh, comics break things, big ideas into smaller chunks, into panels. Um, and I actually, like, you know, as a teacher, even explaining anything, I'll just, I naturally break into panels and chunks ideas at a time. Um, and, you know, poetry falls into that sort of um, pacing and much like music. Um, and the other piece that I wanted to make sure I mentioned was um, thought bubbles. <laughs> like, it comes with comics. Like, you can all have thought bubbles, and you can show what's on your mind in this quiet, um, peaceful way. So, um, and of course, all the beautiful metaphors that are available visually that are really hard maybe to discuss, and certain topics are hard to discuss, but in a drawing, you can get this thought across, but what, you know, that you can create that sense of empathy of what someone else is going through. I think um, one of the things that this kind of goes back to my earlier point about elitism is that 
this is the this is like my biggest fear about comics in general is like it be, as it becomes more mainstream and more people are interested in it and more people get involved in it that it will become elitist because right now it's not right anybody it's very utilitarian it's very like um, it's very for for everybody like you don't have to wait you know like if you want to make a comic and you want to like put your stuff out into the world there's no gatekeepers right you just got to get into a show like mice and put your stuff on a table and then talk to people and sell it um there's no real gatekeeper to it and there are gatekeepers to all of these other things that we've talked about there's gatekeepers to the to the painting world there's gatekeepers to the gallery world there's gatekeepers to the publishing world there's a lot of gatekeepers and those gatekeepers um have a tendency to be elitist and you, i'm starting you were, you can start to see that a little bit now with uh, a friend of mine told me that they had talked to a, 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 a comic book agent who was a really big, big deal agent. And the, um, the agent said, I don't I only want to talk to you if you have 40,000 followers on Instagram, um, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, There's so many people who are just like making books that are best selling in there and bothering with their social media know, presence because exactly. they're busy. Um, <laughs> so like there's a lot of that out there in the world. And um you know, like that's the, that's my biggest fear because right now the best thing about comics and the reason that it touches and gets cl it, it gets, you know, it it reaches out to so many people is that because you can't there's so many people who can see themselves in those books whether they're LGBTQI plus whether they're black kids brown kids you know. Like, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that, you know, there there's so many like I had my the most diverse class of students I had was my first comic in the my first comic group, which are, they're, they're back there in the back, like saying, yeah, I'm like, it was us. that was like my most diverse group of students that I ever had was that first cohort of students in that comic arts program in New Hampshire. Uh, I mean, saying diversity in New Hampshire is a really interesting thing altogether, but we can have that conversation after <laughs> that. But um, but yes. Yeah, so like it's like this thing that a lot of people can relate to and I think that when you have so many when there have when there are so many opportunities and there's so many ways in which people can relate to that thing it opens up opportunity for looking at mental health it opens up opportunities to looking at um, things that we have all struggled with um, our individual things that we have struggled with so I think that I'm just afraid that that elitism may actually come up and change that. And I'm, it's my hope that, you know, as people get more successful, including my panelists here, we get more successful. We don't become the gatekeepers mm -hmm. that keep out the next wave of things that we don't understand. If anything, we're trying to be the gate openers, <laughs> we're trying to share as much information as we can because we're teachers we're trying to yeah. make it available, make it free, let it feel open. And yeah. Absolutely. I actually love that you specifically referenced uh, thought bubbles. I was reading this amazing, mildly elitist take on, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, but uh, they were they were talking about um, the Peanuts comic strip, right? So this thing that is like in every newspaper in America and has just been this kind of cultural icon. Really the first place that we were seeing thought bubbles and how, you know, especially in the 60s, how this kind of space to have this inner monologue mm -hmm. on the page was just absolutely revolutionary and I think that's such a, a really kind of beautiful thing now too that there's this this notion of your inner and outer world can kind of be separated and examined and exist in this space um, and also to kind of just think a little bit about this the like, craziness about social media you know it's just how we're consuming images I always think about how we consume images and social media particularly Instagram is kind of like a love-hate relationship like I think it's insane that we're counting followers and at the same time I think it's a great platform because it's visual right you put it out there you're not paying for it it's another way to kind of consume things in sequence and curate and have this kind of interesting dialogue so I think it's always going to be this kind of catch-22 about how do you reach an audience how do you say what you need to say in a really authentic way um, and still kind of fight these these systems that we're putting up into into this art world again mm. but check out that article i think it was in the new yorker which is oh. deeply elitist i get it but it's <laughs> awesome and it's just like the most elitist i know the most elitist <laughs> thing ever but i was like thought bubbles what it's great and i think the fact that shows like this uh do so well and that's that's encouraging um like you talked you mentioned reina i met reina at a show much like this before smile mm -hmm. came out so she was doing exactly what you said joel she was do she was working on her own comics and she was out there talking to people now she's one of the most celebrated in the industry mm -hmm. um 
and in you know you never know not just comics and yeah. publishing yeah. yeah yeah i mean <sighs> she's she's doing everything and she's if you've ever met her she's very humble they she was here a couple of years ago um she's very humble and she's still the very same person i met that one day you know so you know you never know you talk to the folks here and and get to know them and they can be resources for you in the future they are the next big thing mm -hmm. they're here they're working now yeah. they could be you could be you um so we have like five minutes <laughs> for audience questions i'm just gonna because we're talking about social media i'm gonna throw the contact information up while we do audience questions so you can take a picture of this with your phone and please follow these folks myself and all the other panelists the websites are here information about how to reach them and how to to get to their resources and um how to hear from them on social media because we all um, need followers yeah we, yeah we they need 40,000 followers <laughs> so let's get that going um but yes audience questions so, please other fields like science and history, but do you think that that runs the risk of something that's just a comic only, like, are comics only worthwhile when they're linked to something more like serious and legitimate and they can't just like stand on their own as a worthwhile thing? But comics, but that's what comics are, right? Yeah. Like, so you, like, the thing that I think people, like, people legitimately get into this, this, this sort of, and that's, that's a, that's a thing that's elitist. Comics is a thing. Right, comics is like a paintbrush. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not like the paintbrush. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, I only appreciate sort of serious things like Persepolis and Mouse. Not as someone who's just like pushing. Who's just really just just purely just pushing the bounds of what you can do with like panel arrangements and type. Of but even but I, but I think even then though, like I think when you run the risk of saying okay. that. It's only it's I don't think you should like that's the thing like comics is a medium right it's a way in which people express themselves and so a person who like only makes science comics or comics about like you know comics and medicine which is now a big thing mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that that people who read that are only in, like that's they like it's just like somebody who reads science fiction I'm only interested in science fiction okay you know like yeah. I mean that's yeah. okay right <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's really okay. Like as long as long as they don't think comics is this one thing. Like if there's somebody that comes up to me, it's like, yeah, Joel, like I, I like I'm really into comics, but I only like comics. I only like you know history. I'm like, cool, that's what I draw, right? <laughs> and somebody comes up to me, it's like, I really like comics. Like I go to a comic show and I draw comics about Black history. So I go there and I go to a pop culture comic con and I'm like, now I'm in a place where like I don't fit, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I draw comics and this is supposed to be a thing. So I think that's that's the thing. Like I don't think it's like. I don't think we should, you know, condemn people who are only interested in comics if they're connected to something else, because they actually are looking at comics as a medium. They actually mm -hmm. are doing the thing that we want them to do. Is like the medium is a default. Like I'm just interested in this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if those books end up in the hands of kids and then they go buy more comics, that's a good thing too. Yeah, yeah I mean, we every we don't make work in isolation. No artist makes work in isolation. You're making work to put it out in the world. So I think the fact that you, you want an audience and if we start to kind of like thin slice what we expect of that audience, we get into some real kind of deep trouble, I think, in terms of that. So I, I just kind of go back that it's like, yeah, whoever's reading it or are looking at it or attending, it's like, those are your people. You know, I'm not going to worry about the, the nuance of it in a lot of ways because you're making work to put it out in the world and you want it to be consumed. So I'm not going to prevent people from consuming it. You know, I, I did my part. It's out there. You know, let it, let it live. <laughs> Um, in terms of legitimizing comics in like, the fine arts world, do you think there's any value in trying to conceive of an exhibition in a museum place about comics or graphic novels? Um, and like, what would that look like to you guys? I know you said something about printing things out and just sort of like, slapping them on the walls. Yeah. Um, but for, like, space to think about what that would be like. Was it the Pompidou who had a... Uh, the uh, the uh, the manga artist who did a uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure had a show in the Pompidou, um, and that's like if you look up like canonization of comic arts, it's all based on the museum shows and the curation of the museum shows. Um, so there are a few out there. I um I don't know. Like I mean, I'm like it's the, it's it's one of the like I, I'm I'm okay with other people looking at that stuff and saying I want to see like the individual pages and I want to look at it as an art form. But I just as a cartoonist don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's different. So you know it it becomes difficult for me to like pick out pages 
like I have a show coming up in um, in January and I'm it's difficult for me to go through it. Like I've been putting off sending them the images to print off because I'm just like, I don't know what to send you. Um, Cause I feel like that, like I can send you all the books. Why don't you just put the books under boxes and let right. people, like that's what I'm thinking in my head because yeah. that's the work. Like when I like, when a book comes out, like this book is only one of them, right? And like I'm walking around holding this book and showing it to people. I'm not taking the individual pages around. I'm like, look, here's this page that I drew. You know what I mean? Um, so like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, like I'm okay with somebody else looking at it because I think that the people who look at the individual pages and think about the careers of artists, like it's kind of like thinking in terms of like what are art historians going to talk about when they talk about me? Like I don't care. I don't like I, that's is pretentious for one thing, and like I just don't I don't make work for that. Um, if somebody wants to see my work, I sort of just deal with what they would like to see. Like let's talk about what you want to see. Um, so I just put that, I, you know, mostly it's just individual pages, like matted and framed and people want to buy them occasionally. And so you sell them like I like money. So um, I sell the work, but um, it's just not how I think about it. I'm OK if somebody else is like thinking about it in that in those. So like a curator or a gallerist or whatever, thinking about the work in that way, that's OK for them. But for me, it doesn't work that way. I have to think about the individual book as the work. I think it's also just kind of considering the objecthood of some of these things. You know, the traditional art museum setting that we're so used to is the preciousness of the white wall and putting it on the wall and, you know, in, in parsing these things out. Um, but I think comics are physical. Like, they're books. They're, they're, you're engaging in them. You're physically picking that up. Um, and I think that's tricky for gallery spaces and museums to navigate because, oh, my God, like, you might break something or you might disturb the white cube. So I think it's, it's, it's thinking about how we mediate that consumption, you know. And I also think it's, it's kind of good to just ask the artist. You know, Joel, clearly, you want your as books and I say I would love that as a you know as an audience member being able to go and touch something so it's kind of breaking that barrier of the object hood and how we kind of conceive of things on the wall or the preciousness of it um, and being a little bit less precious in how we consume the work in general uh, I'm afraid we have to stop here because we are done thank you for coming Thanks to all the panelists for their time and this amazing conversation. So um, I'm sure we'll be hovering outside if you have additional questions for anybody. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the show. I have cards if you want a card. Come, come take a card. <laughs>